happy happy monday everybody tuning in here for the very first stream of the week live on youtube it was a big night for the judgment day it's a very busy night for the judgment day on smackdown friday night asuka was presented with the brand new wwe women's undisputed championship rhea ripley might dispute that so tonight rhea ripley got her own new belt, because you can't give one without the other. So Rhea Ripley tonight was bestowed the brand new WWE Women's World Heavyweight Championship. It's exactly what we talked about the other night. Mirrors the men's titles on each show. So Asuka has her own on a white strap, her own version of the Roman Reigns belt. And now Rhea Ripley has her own version of the Seth Rollins belt as well. So she's got her shiny new toy. So that takes care of Rhea Ripley. Then we had Dominic Mysterio, her boy toy. And Cody Rhodes was on the show tonight, and Cody Rhodes issued a challenge to Dominic to a one-on-one -on -one match at Money in the Bank that Rhea accepted on his behalf. So now we know it will be Cody Rhodes going one-on-one -on -one with Dominic in London at Money in the Bank. So that takes care of Dominic. Then we had Damian Priest. In the final men's qualifying match for Money in the Bank, it was Damian Priest and Matt Riddle one-on-one. -on -one. Damian Priest moving on to the Money in the Bank ladder match. He has qualified. He has the chance now to take the briefcase home, back home to the U.S. So that's one, two, that's three of the four members of the Judgment Day. That only left one, and that was Finn Balor, who called out Seth Rollins, the World Heavyweight Champion. He called him out. And he challenged him to a match for the World Heavyweight Championship, of course, at Money in the Bank. He can't be left out. Like uh, Damian was at WrestleMania this year. All the members of the Judgment Day will be accounted for this year. Assuming, of course, Rhea, I guess Rhea doesn't have a challenger at this point, so who knows? Maybe she won't have a match. But this is the rematch now. They're, they're going to bill it as the rematch seven years in the making. Even though these two have had... I, believe by my count seven matches on television since 2016 it is the rematch seven years in the making when Finn Balor and, Ro and Roman Reigns Finn Balor he beat Roman Reigns to actually advance to SummerSlam ah yes when he debuted on Raw he actually pinned Roman Reigns with the double stomp but of course he got injured at SummerSlam first universal championship match we all remember that Finn Balor remembers that he let Seth Rollins know all about that tonight. So a lot of Judgment Day influence on the show tonight. We have the Bloodline on Fridays. On Mondays, it is reserved for the Judgment Day. We had a hot main event with Gunther and Ludwig Kaiser challenging Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn for the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championship. This was the uh, best match on the entire show, and... Between that and the Money in the Bank qualifying match, those were the two best things on the show tonight. I very much enjoyed that match as well, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. Outside of those two matches, I thought this was a boring show. Those two matches really saved the show for me. I like the story they're telling, you know, as far as getting all the members of the Judgment Day involved in different things on TV. I think that's cool. Uh, there's no reason why they can't get the same kind of treatment on Mondays that the Bloodline gets on, on Fridays. But there just wasn't enough elsewhere on the show to really, you know, keep me all that interested. There's just not a, a whole lot else going on that's uh, terribly exciting on the show. Hey, perhaps that will change next week when I know your favorite superstar, Logan Paul, is going to be returning to Raw next week. And that has me wondering about the Money in the Bank match, too. We'll get into that. This is your Monday Night Raw review for June 12th, 2023. I am the Solomon Monster. Like and subscribe. The goal tonight for Be The Booker is 400. 400 likes is what I am looking for. So go ahead and uh, hit that thumbs up if you will. Super chats are open. Any uh, that come in, I'll be reading them, hanging out with you a little bit later on. And, of course, memberships are open if you want to become a member of the GWO, our little green world G order. GWO. Oh. Applications are open, so feel free to go ahead and check out the two tiers if you uh, would like to become a channel member, or perhaps you would you know, prefer to gift a channel membership. You are certainly able to uh, do that as well. Tomorrow, 
little programming note here. Tomorrow, I am going to be live with you on YouTube. Like, I'm live with you right now, less than 24 hours away. 1 o'clock Eastern time on Tuesday. Tomorrow is the 30th anniversary of the greatest King of the Ring pay-per-view that WWE has ever done. And we are going to watch all three of the Bret Hart, since he won the tournament, all three of the Bret Hart matches in the King of the Ring tournament from 1993. So that'll be open to everybody, but it will be members only in the chat. So if you want to hang out, interact, you got to be a channel member. So that's tomorrow, Tuesday, 1 o'clock Eastern. I hope to see you back here for the watch along. I'm very much looking forward to that. It really is probably my favorite pay-per-view of all time. And again, we're not going to watch the entire show, but we'll watch the important stuff. Hey, uh, M. Mills just gifted five channel memberships. That's five people who will be able to hang out with us tomorrow in the live chat. So shout out to M. Mills. You are awesome. Now, before we get into Raw, we have some breaking news that has nothing to do with WWE. Uh, it is not very often that we hear about Tony Khan firing people or letting people go from AEW. And so on those rare occasions when it does happen, you know it's got to be bad, whatever it is. Uh, we found out uh, earlier this evening that former Ring of Honor tag team champion BJ Whitmer, uh, who has been working for AEW in a backstage capacity as a coach and a producer, really since the founding of the company from the very beginning back in 2019, uh, he has been let go in the wake of an arrest that took place back on June 4th. Uh, per PW Insider, court records indicate that Whitmer has been charged with strangulation. That's not a good strangulation first degree, which is a class C felony in the state of Kentucky where this allegedly happened, uh, carries a penalty possibly of five to 10 years in prison. He's also been charged with burglary second degree, also a class C felony in Kentucky punishable possibly by five to 10 years in prison. He was released on $25,000 bond earlier this afternoon. Once AEW learned uh, that he was behind bars, once they learned that he was incarcerated uh, and they learned about the charges and the nature of the charges against him, uh, they immediately investigated the allegations and he was dismissed from the company. He is gone. An AEW spokesperson issued the following statement this evening. B.J. Whitmer has been terminated following his arrest on domestic violence charges. While talent and staff are ultimately responsible for their own personal actions, this behavior is intolerable within AEW. AEW has reached out to offer support to those impacted by his behavior. So that is the update on uh, B.J. Whitmer. Arrested on charges of uh, domestic violence, strangulation being among the allegations, AEW said they investigated whatever they found. They didn't like it. They thought that there was merit to it, and they said, adios. And so he is gone. So I, I'm sure I will have more to say on this as more information comes out in the coming days. But uh, right now, that is all that we know. So uh, let's get into this raw review here. Adam Pearce was in the ring on Friday to present Asuka with the new WWE Women's Championship, as I mentioned before. So on Raw tonight, Adam Pearce was already in the ring when the show started. And Rhea Ripley came on down to the ring all by herself, and she had her SmackDown Women's title with her. Pearce introduced her as the new women's, und well, world heavyweight. I guess women's world uh, heavyweight. Well, <laughs> I shouldn't say heavyweight. Seth Rollins is the world heavyweight champion. I guess we shouldn't be calling the women's champion the heavyweight champion, but she is the uh, world champion, whereas Asuka is the WWE champion, in case you're confused by all of the designations. So that is officially what the new title is uh, being called. And this right here, covering my face here, but this, again, hot off WWE shop. I don't even think the segment was officially over yet, and they already had this up on WWE shop. You can pre-order it right now, 500 bucks, just like the, uh, the new Asuka belt. Not surprisingly, as you can see here, it is the same design as the men's world heavyweight title, but it is on a white strap. And I, I blew up this image here. If you look really close, and it, it's hard to see, but if you look really close, 
you can see the word women's. Because at first, it didn't look like the word women's was on the belt. It actually is. If you look at the top of the belt where it says the word, wor the word world, right above world, there's some text. And it does say women's up there. I will say this, you know, looking at Seth's belt and now looking at Rhea's belt, Raw definitely beats SmackDown when it comes to their titles. You had to compare the championships now on both shows. The belts on Monday, clearly better than the belts on Friday. I'm sorry. So Rhea was very excited. Let's pop her out there. There you go. There's Rhea. She'll keep us company here for the rest of the segment. Dominic Mysterio jogged on down to the ring. He was also very excited. Looked, uh, looked like a, an excited little boy. And he came down to the ring and he Velcroed the belt around Rhea's waist. Cody Rhodes interrupted the party. He was already in his gear, his, his jacket and everything because he had a match coming up. So he got into the ring. He said that he had nothing but respect for Rhea Ripley. But what he actually wanted to talk about was Dominic. And he pitched it to a replay of what happened last week on Miz TV when Dominic took that cheap shot and he smacked the taste out of Cody's mouth. So Cody said, uh, look, I wish that we were here to hear something from Brock Lesnar, that Brock Lesnar would be here to accept my challenge. But he said Lesnar did not have the balls to do that. Instead, he challenged Dominic to a match. What a come down that is, right? To go from challenging Brock Lesnar, I'll challenge Dominic Mysterio instead. So he challenged Dominic to a match at Money in the Bank. Dominic said that he embarrassed Cody, just like he would embarrass anyone else. Cody wanted an answer. Rhea said that her Latino heat was more of a man than anybody in the building. And Cody again wanted an answer. And it almost felt to me watching this here, like they were they were stalling. I don't know if Miz was late on his cue or or I don't know. It just felt to me like they were stalling uh, because Miz did ultimately hit the ring to try to attack Cody uh, from behind as Rhea was saying that she accepts the challenge on Dominic's behalf. All of a sudden, Miz showed up. Cody saw it coming, though. He knocked Miz out of the ring. This allowed Dominic to get in another cheap shot before he bailed. And as Rhea and Dominic were backing away, Rhea told Cody, we will see you. We will see you at Money in the Bank. So maybe Rhea's not going to have a match and Rhea will be there in Dominic's corner. That, that's what it feels like to me. They are not getting anybody ready for Rhea Ripley. If Rhea Ripley is going to have a match in London, beats me who it's going to be against. I mean, we had Natalia on the show tonight in a backstage segment talking about, you know, Coming off that loss to Rhea Ripley in Saudi Arabia. I don't even know who I am. So now she's got CTE or whatever. So she's doing that. Raquel was made to look like a fucking idiot in her match with Shayna Baszler when Ronda Rousey helped Shayna win. We've got, let's see, who else? We have Valhalla and we have Maxine Dupree. Who else is on this show? Liv Morgan is hurt. I know that. Although I think she might be on SmackDown. But who is there? Who is being primed and prepped to challenge Rhea Ripley at Money in the Bank? I, I have no idea. She'll have a match at SummerSlam. Doesn't look like she's going to have one in London. So why shoehorn her into a match if nobody is ready for that spot? I mean, she, she is just on another level right now from just everybody else on that brand. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But like I said on Friday, you know, WWE taking steps to try to uh, fix the championship situation when it comes to the women's titles in this company. It's long overdue. It's something they had to do. And so now we don't have to worry going forward when they have more drafts and they decide that we're going to draft the champions, which honestly, the champions should be immune from being drafted in the first place. All it does is create situations like this where we have people with red belts on the blue show and people with blue belt, blue, ball, blue belts and balls on the red show. God, I sound like Becky Lynch now, stammering all over my words. Wait until I get to that segment. This eliminates that. Now it's not about colors. It's not about the raw this and the SmackDown that. The titles have different names. They have different designations. Now this had to happen. This was a necessity. And so now that's been taken care of. And no more belt swaps in the future either. 
Cody against Dominic uh, at Money in the Bank, I think, should be a lot of fun uh, in front of those UK fans. Uh, I, I'm expecting a Brock Lesnar appearance. I am expecting a Brock Lesnar run-in to cost Cody the match. Cody is coming out on television every single week. And he is just baiting Brock. He's coming out on television and saying Brock has no balls. He's got no courage. He's got no guts to say yes and accept my challenge. And at some point, Brock is going to pay him back for that. And I think he pays him back and money in the bank by costing him the win. And, and we will never hear the end of it if Dominic pins Cody Rhodes and money in the bank. The heat that that will generate for him anyway in that building is going to it'll be enough to power the entire city of London. So I think that's what's going to end up happening here. And then that leads to the third match with Cody and Brock at SummerSlam, since it's pretty clear at this point that Cody Rhodes is not challenging Roman Reigns, uh, if ever again, until WrestleMania next year. It's pretty much, I mean, it's pretty much a done deal at this point that it's not happening this year. So Cody and Brock three at SummerSlam. And I'm hearing and reading things about a bull rope match. I mean... Where'd you hear that, right? We were ta- I was talking about this on the podcast at least a week ago, maybe two weeks ago. There were two ideas that I pitched for this match. I said, I could see this match being one of two things. Either a bull rope match, because that's a dusty thing. So, of course, I could see Cody wanting to do a bull rope match. Or the fight pit, which would make all the sense in the world for someone like Brock Lesnar. We haven't seen the fight pit since Extreme Rules last year with Riddle and, and uh, Rollins. So I think it ends up being one of those two. Uh, bull rope match may well be it, but uh, we'll find out. We'll find out next month. It's going to be a while before we get the announcement of that third match. Now, I wanted to address this also because I know that there are some people. All right, say, say goodbye to Rhea. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, I know there are some people who think that having Cody in Money in the Bank, as opposed to wrestling a random match against Dominic Mysterio, that doing Cody against uh, the other men in the Money in the Bank match to try to grab the briefcase would make more sense, that he would go after the contract and try to get a shot at whatever championship he wants, maybe Roman Reigns, and that would make sense. And at one point, I was kind of hoping that's what they would do, so we would get that match at SummerSlam, and now, of course, it looks like we're not going to be getting that. But even if Brock is going to be there to cost Cody his match, right? You have Cody in the Money in the Bank match. Cody is on the ladder. He's just fingertips away from pulling down the briefcase. And you could still have Brock come out and screw him. All Brock has to do is come down and push the ladder over. Right? And Cody takes a tumble. And Brock has now screwed Cody out of winning the Money in the Bank briefcase. So, yes, you could do that. I would push back on the idea for this reason. You have L.A. Knight. Who is in the Money in the Bank match this year? And it's very clear if you watch the television shows every single week that LA Knight is over. Everywhere they go, he gets chants. People, you know, pop for him when he comes out. He's getting more and more popular, and he's not even doing much, but the people seem to like him, right? It's pretty clear. Now they're going to go to the UK. These people are nuts. I mean that in the best possible way, right? You're going to have this wild, loud, energetic crowd. They're going to be chanting all kinds of things. And I'm, I'm sure that when L.A. Knight comes out, he's going to get a great reaction. And there's going to be a lot of people in that crowd who want to see him win Money in the Bank. I think it's very possible. They don't want Cody in that situation where he's in a match where somebody else is more popular than him and is getting chants from the crowd and has crowd support behind him. And anybody else who tries to scale that ladder and pull down the briefcase might get booed except for L.A. Knight. I don't think they want to run into a situation where Cody is in that match and possibly gets booed or at least gets a reaction other than just loud 100% support from the crowd. Because you know that LA Knight is going to be a fan favorite in that match. And so I think that probably factors into their thinking. And then it does make sense that you wouldn't put Cody in that situation. It would make him look bad. So keep him out of the money in the bank match. Put him in the ring with somebody who will get him I mean, it will it will get anybody who steps in the ring with Dominic is going to be cheered like a conquering hero because they're going to want to see this little brat get his comeuppance. So in terms of protecting Cody and protecting his reactions, I mean, Cody is over enough. I'm not saying that, you know, he has to be coddled or anything, but I think it's it's probably the smart way to go. And 
uh, that probably is something that factored into their line of thinking. Now, speaking of Cody, he was up next. He had a match on this show one-on-one -on -one against The Miz. Rhodes wrestled with the titanium cast on his arm. And Miz took control by running him arm first into the ring steps outside. For the finish, Cody blocked a skull-crushing finale, hit a Cody cutter, and then crossroads for the win. Cody got bloodied up and looked like maybe on the uh, back of his head. I, I assume it was when he got sent into the ring steps. Uh, so it wasn't anything major, but it was definitely, you can see blood on his shoulder, and I think it was coming from the back of his head. Uh, no Hurricane Ranas from Miz this week. No Hurricane Ranas, no springboards. Pretty much your standard run-of-the-mill Miz match here. Becky Lynch was out to the ring next for a promo. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Becky was out, uh, but not before a commercial. Actually, I should, mention, I should mention this first. Not before a commercial. Before they cut away for the break, Kevin Patrick, our old pal Kevin, on commentary, uh, teased Becky against Chelsea Green, which was coming up next or as he called it before Corey Graves corrected him, uh, Becky Lynch against Becky Green. And uh, Corey had to correct him and say, there is no Becky Green? I mean, I'm sure there, there is a Becky Green somewhere in the world. I don't know if she's a professional wrestler or not. Uh, but it was Becky Lynch against Chelsea Green coming up on the other side of this break. See, I think he just he's such a big fan of Becky Lynch. I mean, obviously they have a lot in common that, you know, he just renamed her opponent Becky. He's got Becky on the brain. Like, so we come back, and Becky is in the ring for a promo. She said that she was lucky to do a lot of things in her career, but winning money in the bank has always eluded her. She's never won the money in the bank. She's headlined WrestleMania, right? She's won the Royal Rumble. She's won multiple championships. All these things that she's done. She's never won a money in the bank match. She had a good feeling about this year. She said that we've all been conditioned to believe that the best person is the person who holds the championship. The irony of that was that the number one person was the person who held the power, and that person was the one who held the briefcase. They had a power, or they had the power, to make the champion scared and scare people. People who were scared do dangerous things. She said she liked it when people did dangerous things because it made her better. She said uh, you didn't have to look any further than Trish Stratus as an example. Trish was so scared that she got herself an insurance policy in Zoe Stark. Now let me stop here. I didn't really do justice to how bad this was. This was not good. This was not good. Becky was stumbling all over herself. This was, this was dreadful. Zoe Stark interrupted to stop the pain. Or so I thought. I was hoping that Zoe Stark would come out. I know she doesn't have a lot of experience cutting promos live on, on Raw. She's still new to the main roster. But she came out. I was hoping, okay, finally, this will be the end of that. Well, unfortunately, the pain only got worse. Zoe said that Becky had a lot of accomplishments, but she'll never be able to say that she beat Trish Stratus. She said losing to her at Money in the Bank would be Becky's next failure. Becky knew that Stark was a pit bull, but she had no personality, she said. Zoe told Becky to look in the mirror because the only reason she got popular was because somebody else broke her face. And Zoe, at this point, she was randomly yelling, raising her voice for some reason. It was very, very weird. She threatened to break Becky's face at Money in the Bank and make her famous. I, I don't know what happened here. Everybody is entitled to, a, to an off night. Everybody is entitled to a bad night. This entire segment was fucking terrible. Both promos, I mean, this was just fucking terrible, this segment was. Chelsea Green and Sonya Deville, they interrupted. They made excuses for Sonya's loss last week before Becky cut them off and told Chelsea to get in the ring. So thankfully, the talking portion of this was over. And now it was time for some in-ring action. We had Becky Lynch one-on-one -on -one against Chelsea Green. Zoe sat on top of a ladder on stage and watched as the match took place. Corey Graves said that Trish Stratus wasn't here tonight because she was shooting her 110th magazine cover. And that's probably a, a cover excuse, but 
I wouldn't be surprised if she was shooting her 110th cover because Trish Stratus, she has shot a lot of covers. She used to be a fitness model. She's shot a lot of covers over the years. And even after all these years, what is she now, 47 years old? Trish is still out there. She's still, you know, magazine cover material. So maybe she was. I don't know what magazine it would have been, but she wasn't there tonight. Becky went for the disarm her. Chelsea countered into a pin attempt for a near fall. Becky immediately applied the disarmer, and she got the submission win. And it's kind of a similar thing. We had back-to-back -back matches here, right? We had Miz against Cody, and here we had Chelsea against Becky. And it's the same thing. And look, everybody on this show should have a role. And you will always have people on this show who are really there for one reason only, which is to just put other people over. And, and that's pretty much the role Miz has been in for a while. Chelsea, I like I like the character. They're not really doing much with it right now. I wish they would do more. Uh, I, still, I still think the whole pairing of her and Carmella had potential, but obviously Carmella had to go away for reasons that we weren't aware of, and now we are, and so it is what it is. But Chelsea loses all the time. She loses all the time. She's not meant to be taken seriously. So when you have matches like this, it's hard to get into them because you get back-to-back -back matches with two people who are booked in a way where they're not meant to be taken seriously. We got a video recap of Seth Rollins uh, beating Damian Priest last week to retain his World Heavyweight Championship, followed by Rollins taunting Finn Balor when the match was over. So we come back live, and in the back, we had Rhea, Dominic, Priest and Balor all walking backstage. Ripley noticed that Balor wasn't paying attention to the conversation. It looked like his mind was elsewhere. Maybe he was thinking of Trish Stratus on that magazine cover. Whatever he was thinking of, Becky or uh, Rhea, I still, I'm still thinking of Becky. Rhea is basically trying to snap him out of it and saying, Hey, you okay? Everything cool? And Balor said he just had a lot on his mind. Priest said that he would qualify tonight for Money in the Bank against Matt Riddle. And he asked the other members, I want to go out there tonight to do this by myself. I don't need your help. I don't want you out there with me. I'm going to go this one alone. And he was staring at Balor. He was kind of behind Balor. So Balor, I don't think Balor really saw him staring at him, but uh, he was staring at Balor as he said that after what happened last week when he told the members of the Judgment Day, I got this against Seth and, and agreed to have them banned from ringside. Balor came out anyway. Priest lost. And there was a little bit of an issue there between the two of them. So he didn't want to have a repeat of that this week. Uh, as Priest walked off for his match, Balor did not look pleased. But we had Damian Priest down to the ring next. One-on-one -on -one with Matt Riddle, the final men's qualifying match for Money in the Bank this year. And this turned out to be the best of all the qualifying matches that we have had on television over these last few weeks. Riddle hit a broton. Priest went to the outside. Riddle went to the apron and got a springboard dive to the floor, took down Damien. Back inside, Riddle hit a German suplex into a bridge for a near fall. Late in the match, Riddle caught Priest on the top rope. Uh, this was after Riddle had rolled out of a razor's edge attempt. So Priest was on the ropes. He was going to give Riddle a razor's edge. I think it was from the middle rope. And so we had him in position for it. And Riddle was able to kind of roll over and flip over onto his feet and avoid that. But then Riddle got back up on the ropes and he hit a fisherman's superplex. Now I've seen a fisherman buster. Kevin Owens does that a lot from the middle rope. This was a fisherman's superplex from the top rope, which uh, was very impressive. That got a nice reaction and a near fall. Riddle went for the floating bro. He rolled through when Priest avoided it. Riddle hit the ropes. He was going for some kind of a springboard move, but as he hit the ropes, before he could even springboard off, uh, Priest caught him in position for the razor's edge, and this time he dropped him. And he pinned Matt Riddle to qualify for money in the bank. I love that he won with the razor's edge. It's like when... Those, those rare occasions when we get to see Sami Zayn win with the Blue Thunder Bomb. We'll talk about that later. But he won with the Razor's Edge. There were no kickouts. There was no shoulder up at the last second. He won with the move. That, to me, is the best possible tribute you could give to Scott Hall. Because for all the years that he used that move in WWE, 
Only one person ever kicked out of the razor's edge. I think of all the times that he used that move, all the feuds, all the people he worked with, all the times that he hit the razor's edge and then went for the pin and didn't, you know, just lay there. He won with it. It was not a move. It was it was protected. It was protected in the way that moves like the bro kick and the end of days are protected. I don't know any other finishers, frankly, that are as protected as the bro kick and the end of days. The bro kick, I can understand. Sheamus is still, you know, he's still relatively pushed. Corbin, I'll never understand. Look at what Baron Corbin has become. Look at what Baron Corbin has been reduced to. And for some reason, they still protect that fucking move. The end of days, I don't remember. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's been kicked out of Drew McIntyre or somebody. But again, certain moves are, are protected. And the only person who ever kicked out of the razor's edge in WWE was Crush. When he was doing the Kona Crush, Kona Crush, yeah, Shaka Bra, right? That was Kona Crush. It was on an episode of All-American Wrestling that I'm sure very few people either saw or remember. But otherwise, it was always a very protected move. So this is a really good match. Uh, really enjoyed this match. Gunther and Ludwig Kaiser, they come out when the match is over. They walk out immediately after. Priest is still in the ring, and he's staring at Gunther from afar. So the two of them lock eyes. We have a little bit of a stare down going on. Hmm. I wonder who was discussing this very idea just this past weekend on the podcast, just, uh, just yesterday, in fact. Talking about the possibility of Damian Priest being the one to take the Intercontinental title from Gunther after Gunther breaks the Honky Tonk Man's record, right? Who's going to be the one to take the championship from him? Damian Priest seems like he's on the fast track soon to a babyface turn. We are just talking about the idea yesterday. Now, that's not what this was meant to, uh, to kind of build up, because when they went face-to-face -face in the aisle, Priest told Gunther, go ahead and pick the bones. This didn't have anything to do with Priest. This was Imperium extracting revenge on Matt Riddle for what Riddle did to Kaiser and Vinci last week backstage when he attacked them. And Riddle got all serious and he put Vinci in an ankle lock. That's why Vinci wasn't on the show tonight. Vinci was nowhere to be found. He was selling the effects of the ankle lock that Riddle put him in last week. So Gunther and Kaiser hit the ring, and Gunther worked over Riddle. Kaiser just kind of watched, and he was taunting him. Kaiser picked him up, held his arms while Gunther chopped him. It's been pretty clear uh, over the last couple of weeks uh, that the championship match for Money in the Bank is going to be Gunther uh, defending against Matt Riddle, especially, again, after what Riddle did to Imperium last week. The announcer said that the field has been set for the men's Money in the Bank ladder match. I am not convinced of that. And I will explain why later. But the field is Damian Priest, Shinsuke Nakamura, Ricochet, LA Knight, Santos Escobar, and Butch. So as of tonight, we have a six-man field for the men's Money in the Bank match, and I believe it is the same for the women's match as well. Uh, hey, Jamil has been a channel member for a couple of months. Says, uh, Solo the Goat, always enjoy your streams. Well, Jamil, thank you for being a channel member. I'm glad you enjoy your uh, stay here. Make yourself at home. We got a lot more of these coming up this week. Kathy Kelly interviewed Cody Rhodes in the back about his match being made official with Dominic for Money in the Bank. He said that Dominic is going to get hurt. Brock Lesnar is not going to show up. <laughs> Wink, wink. He said that he's clinging to every second as he tries to finish the story. He said Lesnar and Dominic won't knock him off his path, and he wished Dom Dom good luck in London. Byron Saxton was backstage. Byron was with Natalia. He said that people are saying that ever since her match with Rhea Ripley at Night of Champions, she just hasn't been the same. And Natty said that maybe you never being the same is a good thing, because being uh, that she hasn't really been herself, she kind of lost sight of who she even is. She said that uh, maybe I don't even know how to be myself anymore. And she marched off. So I don't know what the hell this is leading to. Coming up with some kind of a story for Natalia. We'll see if they stick with it. Remember they had something going with Candace and Nikki Cross 
What the hell ever happened to that story? Who knows? So she marches off, and then Byron looks over and he sees the undisputed tag team champion. So he says, let's go talk to Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. Kevin Owens was wearing a Mean Gene Okerlund t-shirt, which automatically makes him cool. He said that he looked forward to getting payback after coming so close to being Gunther, uh, beating Gunther last week. So then Gunther and Kaiser interrupted. Kaiser reminded Owens that he lost last week. Zayn said that it took three of them to beat Owens, and he wondered where their bald friend was. And he's uh, licking his wounds after what happened last week in the back. Adam Pearce showed up. He wanted everybody to settle down, and Kaiser challenged them to put their tag team titles on the line tonight because their match was scheduled to be non-title. So he said, put put your championships on the line. Owens freaked out because that's his new gimmick. He freaks out. He starts screaming and, and talking and rambling. He accepted the challenge. Gunther told Pearce to make the match official for the titles, and Pearce said that he would think about it. I'm gonna think about it, he said. What's there to think about? What is there to think about? We had Charlotte Flair return on SmackDown Friday night and challenge Asuka to a championship match. Asuka said yes. Adam Pearce was in the fucking ring when this happened, and they made the match official. It's happening on SmackDown in three weeks. What is so different about this? This just happened on Friday. Now he's got to make phone calls. We, we don't know, by the way, we never know who the mystery man is that he's always on the phone with in the back when he has to make these decisions official. We assume it's Vince McMahon. It could be Triple H. It's probably Vince. But it's never acknowledged who it is, right? It's like like the Wizard of Oz, right? We don't know who the wizard is behind the curtain. But then in other situations, he'll be in the back and he'll make it official on the spot. It's just so inconsistent. So I guess sometimes he needs permission and other times he doesn't. Maybe he needs permission for the championship match. Maybe he's consulting with the championship committee. Maybe there's a committee that we're not aware of. I would love to know who's on this committee. Nick Khan, Kevin Dunn, Triple H, Vince McMahon. Of course, Vince McMahon on this committee probably has more voting power than all of them put together. I'll get back to you, he says. Fine. We had Ricochet one-on-one with Bronson Reed. Early in the match, Shinsuke Nakamura, who, like Ricochet, has already qualified for money in the bank. He came out to uh, get a close-up view of the action. That briefly distracted Bronson Reed. Ricochet went on the offensive. Reed, though, draped him over the top rope. So basically what happened here is he picked him up in like a suplex position. And instead, he kind of dropped him forward over the top rope. Reed then goes over to the ropes. He grabs the top rope, and he kind of flings it upward. And Ricochet just takes this exaggerated, fantastic bump back into the ring. Late in the match, Ricochet went for a moonsault off the apron. Reed caught him and then tossed him, lawn darted him at Nakamura, who was sitting next to the announcers at ringside watching the match. Reed put Ricochet back in the ring. He went to the ropes. He was going up for the tsunami splash. Nakamura, though, kicked him, which caused the disqualification. So Bronson Reed has technically beaten Ricochet now. Ricochet was upset with Nakamura after this. As they were bickering, Reed hit Nakamura from behind, which sent him crashing into Ricochet. Reed put Nakamura down. He was setting up for the tsunami, but Ricochet cut off Bronson Reed. Nakamura and Ricochet then teamed up. They were on the ropes together, and they teamed up for a double superplex on Reed that got some holy shit chants that the USA Network censored. Can't hear those holy shit chants. CC violation. Uh, this was good while it lasted. It's it's weird seeing Reed constantly involved with these guys, considering Ricochet's qualified for money in the bank. Nakamura has qualified for money in the bank. Bronson Reed has not. He lost. And yet, they're all seemingly working together. And again, next week, they already announced it's going to be Nakamura one-on-one with Bronson Reed. So if the field really is set and locked in, and they're not doing the second chance qualifiers with all the losers like they've done before. It's just weird that he's involved with these guys when he's not even in the Money in the Bank match. Ricochet and Nakamura, they had words again in the back in another segment later in the show. Uh, So they're building tension between the two. They're really focusing on those two and building tension between them just to give them something to do and, and try to 
you know, make the, the money in the bank match more interesting. They have three weeks to kill. So they've got to try to cause some kind of tension between some of the participants. Finn Balor was out to the ring alone to call out the world heavyweight champion Seth Rollins here in this next segment. Rollins came out and the fans sang his song. Oh, did they sing his song? I could see, I could just see it now. I could see it now. Six months from now, I'm going to feel the same way about this that I feel about the what chance. I can, I can just see it. Right now, it's fun for the fans to do it, but I could just, I could see it now. Six months from now, I'm going to want to burn this in a fire. He comes out, the fans are singing. Balor said that he's been waiting seven years to say this to Seth. But the crowd would not let him speak because they kept singing the song. Rollins finally told him, spit it out if you've got something to say. And Balor said what should have been the highest of highs for him ended up being the lowest of lows. And he was talking about SummerSlam from 2016. He talks about SummerSlam like, like it's his Montreal screwjob. In seven years, dude. Get over it. So he's referring to the, the first ever Universal Championship match where he got injured. And he mentioned the fact, you know, torn bicep, torn pec, torn labrum. He said injuries happen, that's one thing, but you know what bothered me, other than these idiots singing, and the fans kept singing, Balor said that Seth took everything from him. He took his title, he took a year from his career, but guess what? Now it's his turn to take it all back, because he's going to take his title, and he's going to take a year from his career. And he's going to do it at Money in the Bank. Rollins did his annoying hyena cackle and said that this is the Finn Balor that he's been waiting to see. He says, let me paint a picture for you. The inaugural Universal title match in Brooklyn, Finn Balor against Seth Rollins, it sent them on two different career trajectories. One of them got bitter and one of them got better. He said that he got better every single day, and now he is the greatest version of Seth Rollins. He says the proof is right around his waist. He says, you want to crack at this at Money in the Bank? He goes, you are on. But I got to know, Finn, which version of you is going to come to London to fight for this title? He said, because this better, or, uh, well, he was better, bitter, this bitter shell of a former champion, he says he doesn't stand a chance. I don't understand. He just got very excited listening to Finn Balor come at him and talk about him in the way that he was he was all very he was very spirited, right? This is the Finn Balor I've been waiting for. And yet here he's saying, I need to know which version of Finn Balor it's gonna be. If it's this version that I see in front of me, this guy doesn't stand a chance. So which is it? Which one minute you said, this is the version I wanted to see. Now you're saying, this is not the version that I want to see. But then he took it further. He said, uh, the Finn Balor that beat me to become the first ever Universal Champion with his arm hanging off his body, that guy has a shot. So here's the question. Are you going to bring that Finn Balor to Money in the Bank? Or are you going to bring a guy who's been walking around for the past seven years acting like a little bitch? And then we got the mic drop, and Rollins left the room. Later in the show, they made the announcement that the match has been made official. They have consulted with the championship committee. And by a 6-4 uh, to four vote, the committee has voted to approve this championship match for Money in the Bank. So it will be Seth Rollins defending against Finn Balor, which, without it being made official, you and I and everybody watching this already knew this last week. We already knew what the match was going to be. Just the way they went off the air last week, we knew exactly what the match was going to be. It is the rematch seven years in the making. They have had many matches since SummerSlam. Seven. That's one match for each year that has gone by since the SummerSlam match. And now it's for the championship. And so this is seven years in the making here. We're supposed to forget about all those other matches. All those matches happened on television, by the way. A lot of Monday Night Raw matches. Forget it. Your memory has been wiped clean. They never happened. It's almost like their first time since 2016. Now, there, there was some, um, I don't want to say that, I, 
tease may not be the right word because Rollins didn't say anything to really tease it, but just the way he was talking, like what version of Finn are we going to get? We got Demon Balor against him at SummerSlam for the Universal title. So it was, I think the implication was that uh, perhaps we would get the Demon. I don't give a shit about the Demon. I don't care. I know some people, they, they love seeing the Demon. I used to love when Balor, even before he went to WWE, he would always be very creative with the paint. It would be Spider-Man one time, it would be some other character another time. And it was so cool and so creative with all the body paint stuff. And then he went to WWE and they just, you know, he settled on the, the one demon character. And they protected that character for a while. And then they didn't, right? And then, of course, he lost to Roman Reigns in the way that he did a couple of years ago. And that was the end of the, that was the, end of the demon. The demon was dead. They brought the demon back at WrestleMania this year. He lost. If this demon character has any juice left to it at all, I don't think it's very smart to bring the demon back for money in the bank and have him lose a second time back to back like that. So I wouldn't bring back the demon at all, but I certainly wouldn't bring the demon back if he's just going to go in there and lose. If ever, now here's my idea. I will float this to you. You let me know what you think. Here's my, here's what I would do. So I know there's been a lot of talk about what is the future of Drew McIntyre in WWE. Still has not signed a new contract with the company. They are still supposedly miles apart on money, but his issue is creative. Apparently, he doesn't want to come back until he has a creative vision set forth for him that he likes. Until he knows that the company has a real creative direction for his character. So, we may not see him for a while, but the company wants him back as soon as possible. They would love to have him back before Money in the Bank to promote him for the show. Here's what I propose. Here's what I'm thinking. I am thinking if ever there was a great place for Drew McIntyre to come back and make a statement, it would be immediately after Seth Rollins beats Finn Balor at Money in the Bank, Drew McIntyre shows up as a surprise, and he Claymore kicks Seth Rollins and lays him out and turns heel. Now, he might get cheered for that in the UK, but it would be the Drew McIntyre heel turn. First night back lays out Seth Rollins, and then you build to a championship match at SummerSlam. Seth Rollins one-on-one -on -one with Drew McIntyre. And that's how you reintroduce him to television. That's what I would do. If, we, if they can get him back. Maybe they can't get him back. But that's, that's the vision that I see. Is a heel Drew McIntyre. Now, if he doesn't want to go heel, then I guess there, there could be creative problems there. But that's what I would uh, be proposing for him as far as an appearance of Money in the Bank. We had Raquel Rodriguez one-on-one -on -one with one half of the women's tag team champions, Shayna Baszler, with Ronda Rousey in her corner. They got two minutes. Raquel fought off Baszler, set up for the Tejana bomb, but she stopped what she was doing. Why did she stop what she was doing? She stopped what she was doing to go after Ronda Rousey, who jumped up on the apron. Not a whole lot of uh, brain matter in here. So that allowed Shayna Baszler to roll up Raquel for the win with a little assistance that the referee didn't see from Ronda Rousey. And so Shayna Baszler pins Raquel. This made Raquel look like a fucking idiot. Not much else to say about it. We had Chad Gable one-on-one -on -one against Eric of the Viking Raiders. Gable came out dressed like a high school gym teacher. I guess he was supposed to be a coach. He had a whistle. He looked like a gym teacher I had once many years ago. But he took his shirt off before actually wrestling. So he didn't wrestle in that. He, he wrestled in his usual gear. He had Otis and Maxine Dupree in his corner. And Maxine was in actual wrestling gear this time. Eric had Ivar and Valhalla in his corner. Gable hit a diving headbutt during the match. On the outside, all of a sudden, Valhalla goes sprinting towards Maxine Dupree, and as she's coming in, Maxine, she had one spot, and she did it well. She basically sidestepped uh, Sarah Logan and took her over with an arm drag, an actual wrestling move, and she was so excited by this. She was, she was celebrating this wrestling move. It was basically the move that Gable was shown earlier in the show backstage teaching her. So she did the arm drag, and she was very excited about this. Gable inside used a sunset flip into a cradle for the win. Backstage, Finn Balor 
was in conversation with J.D. McDonough. We have not seen McDonough on television in a few weeks. But the last time that we saw McDonough, he was walking off, and we saw Finn Balor coming into the camera shot. Very subtle, but if you, if you watched, you saw that. So now, here they are. They're deep in conversation. And he's telling McDonough that the important thing is making an impact. McDonough thanked him for the advice. He was uh, nodding to point out that Damian Priest was standing right behind him. And McDonough told Balor to take his own advice when it comes to his other problem. And he walked away. Oh, I wonder what that problem is. So McDonough walked out of the shop. Balor turns around. He sees Priest. He congratulates him for qualifying for money in the bank. He's in a far better mood that he was in the backstage segment earlier in the show. Priest congratulated Balor on his title opportunity. It's not a title shot. We don't have title shots in WWE. They're title opportunities. So he congratulated him. Balor wondered if Priest would uh, come after him. If Balor wins the World Heavyweight Championship, and Priest wins the Money in the Bank briefcase, would you cash in on me? And Priest couldn't believe that he would even ask him that question. He says, of course, I promise you, I would never do that. But he did tell Balor, you need to end things with Rollins and Money in the Bank. So the tension between Balor and Priest, it carried over from last week. And this was the first time that we've actually seen Balor and J.D. McDonough interacting here on, on Raw since McDonough got called up. So uh, clearly there is something in motion here as far as not only Priest being excommunicated from the group potentially, but McDonough uh, joining the group, whether he replaces Priest or is added to the group. Uh, that does seem to be the direction they're going in here with this. The main event of the show was Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn defending their undisputed tag team championships against Gunther and Ludwig Kaiser of Imperium. Owens put Gunther down, hit him with a swanton bomb for a near fall. He went for a stunner. Gunther shoved him off and blasted him with a boot to the face. Both men tagged out. Zayn hit an exploder on Kaiser in the corner. Set up for the Huluva kick. Gunther, though, pulled him to the outside. Sammy avoided a big chop from Gunther, who chopped the ring post instead. That poor ring post. Gunther came back with a hard lariat to Zayn in the ring. He didn't... I don't know that he turned him inside out. It was just... It was so fucking good. It was just such a fucking devastating looking move. I'm sure it wasn't fun to take, but uh, visually it just looked devastating. Sammy kicked out. Gunther threw another lariat. Again, only got a two count. Now he was getting frustrated. Gunther hoisted Zayn up. Kaiser came off the ropes with the Imperial Bomb. And then Gunther tried to, to kind of run interference and play, uh, play blockade here. He was trying to block Kevin Owens from breaking up the fall. Owens charged at Gunther, knocked him backwards, and they ended up breaking up the fall anyway. So now Matt Riddle starts to make his way down to the ring. Surrounded by referees and producers trying to stop him from coming out. Gunther sees this. He's outside, and he blasts Riddle because Riddle was able to kind of circumvent. He had a very slick move, Matt Riddle did. In order to avoid being blocked by the referees, he simply... Like he was in a football game. He simply went like this, and he went around the guy. But when he went around the guy and he tried to come down, he got blasted in the face with a big boot by Gunther. But then Kevin Owens put Gunther down with a DDT on the base of the ramp. Owens put Gunther um, down at the same time that in the ring, Sami Zayn put Kaiser down with a blue thunder bomb, and he pinned him. Yes! Sami Zayn wins with the blue thunder bomb. Yes! Love it. That only happens whenever there's a blood moon or Haley's Comet is spotted. It's a very rare occurrence, but we do see it every now and then. So they are still the undisputed tag team champions. This was a hot main event. Predictable distraction. Anybody who was watching this show earlier and saw what happened to Riddle, you had to know with Gunther in the main event that Matt Riddle was going to come out and spoil the party. This is Wrestling 101 here. So even with the predictable outcome, uh, this was a, a great main event here between these two teams. And outside of that main event and the qualifying match with Riddle and Priest, I thought this was a pretty dull show. You may have liked it more than I did. I, I didn't hate the show, but I also didn't think it was all that good outside of those two things. 
At Raw next Monday, I said earlier, Shinsuke Nakamura going to go one-on-one with Bronson Reed. Seth Rollins is going to be hosting an open challenge for the World Heavyweight Championship. Another fucking open challenge in wrestling. How many open challenges can one person take? I just don't know. I, I already don't know. I've lost track of how many we have in AEW. And we have them in WWE as well. And it's one thing if you want to have an open challenge for the TNT Championship. You want to have an open challenge like Orange Cassidy has had for the International Championship. That's one thing. Why do we need an open challenge for a World Heavyweight Championship? We had the John Cena US title open challenge, right, many years ago. We should not have an open challenge for a World Heavyweight Championship. I always thought the World Heavyweight title should be held to a higher standard than the other titles. The titles are what you make of it. It's a work, right? They're not real. But it's up to you to make them feel real. It's up to you to make them feel like, okay, this one is here and everything else is below it. They're trying to establish a brand new World Heavyweight Championship. I know what they're trying to do. They want to make it exciting. They want Rollins to be the fighting champion. Rollins can be the fighting champion, but do we really need another open challenge gimmick, let alone for a world title? The answer is no, we don't. Now, they did not say anything on this show. Rollins did not say anything on this show. He did not address the challenge that was issued to him last week on NXT by Braun Breaker. Braun Breaker at the very end of the show, a little cliffhanger. He was leaving the party in the parking lot. And he's like, oh, by the way, you know, our world heavyweight champion on Monday Night Raw, Seth Rollins, why don't you come on down here to NXT, right? No mention by Rollins. In the commercial they aired, though, they did say that Rollins apparently is going to be on the show tomorrow night. Now, whether that means he'll be live at the Performance Center or they're going to have a video of him, I don't know. But apparently they're saving it for NXT tomorrow night because they want to pop a number. So we'll find out tomorrow what Seth says, how he reacts and responds to Braun Breaker. It would seem to me that if he's having an open challenge that you would have Braun Breaker come on out, right? But it seems unnecessary. Braun's already challenged him. So Braun should not have to come out and accept the open challenge if he's already extended a challenge to Seth separate from that. So I don't know that Braun Breaker is accepting the open challenge. But there's another name they announced for the show next week who might. Logan Paul is coming back for the first time since WrestleMania. And the person he fought and lost to at WrestleMania was Seth Rollins. So Seth Rollins now is the World Heavyweight Champion. He's doing the Open Challenge gimmick. They're in Cleveland, which I think is uh, Logan's hometown. I think he was born in a a suburb of Cleveland. So it's basically like, you know, Cleveland is his hometown. They didn't say what he would be doing. They only said that he would be on the show next week. So is there a possibility that Logan Paul could accept the Open Challenge? I don't think he will. I think there's a chance. I think they might tease it. I think we might get a segment with him and Seth, but I don't think he'll actually be accepting the open challenge. But let's bring it back to Money in the Bank. When I said earlier that I'm not convinced the field of six has been set. Logan Paul is coming back next week, which means that they have an idea in mind for Logan Paul. Whether it's for Money in the Bank, whether it's for a program at SummerSlam. If it was a program at SummerSlam, then he wouldn't be back until after Money in the Bank. Because they're not promoting SummerSlam right now. Right now, their focus is Money in the Bank. So why is Logan Paul coming back? Who would he be wrestling in in a random match on that show? I looked at the Raw roster to see who's on there right now. There's no obvious person. He's had beef before with Seth Rollins. So let's assume he's not accepting the open challenge. Who else is there? I mean, Drew McIntyre is not back yet. And I don't think that Drew McIntyre, if he's holding out for a good creative, is going to to say, I'll only come back if I can wrestle Logan Paul. Right? I don't think that's going to be his first program coming back. There's no other obvious person on the roster who's available right now who I look at that roster and say, that's the guy who is going to be programmed next with Logan Paul. Unless he somehow finds his way into the money in the bank. It would make sense for his character that he would want to get into that match. It's an easy ticket to a world championship, or really any championship match, because they said it on the show tonight. You can cash in for any championship you want to. 
right? He can punch his ticket to a title match by winning one match. Why wouldn't Logan Paul want to be in Money in the Bank? So does he replace somebody? Does they does he get added to the match? He could probably find a way to get added to the match. Instead of having six people, they'll have seven. All of a sudden, if Logan Paul is in Money in the Bank, I don't feel so confident anymore about L.A. Knight. <laughs> if Logan Paul gets into Money in the Bank, I think L.A. Knight is fucked. That's what I think. So I think Logan Paul and Money in the Bank would probably be a lot of fun, but I don't want Logan Paul to win Money in the Bank. I want L.A. Knight to win Money in the Bank. And I think that if he finds his way in there, it's over. I don't know what else he would be on the show for. What other purpose would he have of being on the show next week? Two weeks out from Money in the Bank if he wasn't going to be on that show. I'm telling you, he's going he's gonna to find his way into that ladder match. Maybe, maybe LA Knight will push him off the ladder and he'll take some gigantic bump through the announce desks. Then LA Knight, I mean, my God, he'll be the biggest fucking baby face in London. Holy shit. You could put him on Downing Street. All right. Let's take a look at this Twitter poll here. Here is the raw poll for tonight. 65% of you have given this show a thumbs up. 34% of you have given this show a thumbs down. Not even 500 votes yet. It's almost like there was a basketball game on or something. I mean, how many people were even watching this show tonight? I would love to see those uh, quarter hours for the third hour. Because I was even I was watching part of the basketball game. And uh, it came down to the wire in that game, too, man. That was like a, th a thriller of a finish. So I, I can't imagine the numbers for the end of Raw tonight were all that great. But there, there's your uh, Twitter poll. At Solomonster on Twitter is where you can go to vote. Let me know what you thought of the show. Oh, uh, the NBA Finals in the books. In the books. I'm sure Raw took a shellacking in that final segment tonight. Let's take a look at your Super Chats here, see what you guys have to say. We'll start with the real CS. Hey, brother, thank you for the $9.99. Thank you very much. As a question for me, WWE has been doing side plates for years, but do I know why they decided to replace the name plates with side plates. Uh, side plates look a hell of a lot better than uh, than the name plates. Do. I, I actually don't like these new belts they have because they only have one side plate. They have one plate on the left, one on the right. It looks like a toy. They used to have two plates. Some had three on one side. They had the logo. Now they have one plate on each side. It's just, it's like they've regressed. Clearly, it was a WWE directive because all the belts are like uh, WWE Wrestling and Gaming, do you consider John Cena the biggest wrestling star of his era slash generation? Also, keep up the good work. He probably would be of, of that period of time, and it was almost 15 years, really, that he was pretty much on top. Not a full 15, but... Yeah, I mean, there there wasn't a bigger name in wrestling than John Cena. I mean, as far as just name recognition and just overall star power, I'm not talking about his in-ring ability. Cena was the biggest star. That's why they kept him on top for so long. I mean, they kept him on top for so long because they wanted him there and they, you know, came out with a new t-shirt for him every fucking week. But you saw when he left and he went away, it took a while. You know, for some, to, to establish Roman Reigns in the role that he's in now, where he really does move the needle for them on, like, a lot of the live events and stuff. When Cena went away, I mean, it really, it stung, it stung them for a while. So, yeah, I would say Cena probably uh, would be the guy. Uh, we've got Henry Webster. Hey, Henry, thank you for the 9.99. Up later than normal, not late enough for the live stream, just showing some love before bed. Catch the replay at 4 a.m. He gets up to go to work. He, he's uh, fast asleep right now. Rodimus Prime, besides the good stuff, I felt the same way as the intro concerning tonight's show. That said, congrats to Denver on winning their first NBA title. 
correct me if I'm wrong, but is it not the Stan Kroenke who owns the Denver Nuggets? Is it the Stan Kroenke? The same Stan Kroenke that Vince McMahon basically lost his mind over all those years ago? So much so that he had a, an E. Stan Kroenke impersonator <clears throat> come to Monday Night Raw so that he could basically yell at him like he was some kind of proxy. And then he made fun of him because the E stands for enus. He called him a penis. This is the kind of person we're dealing with here. I can't, I can't imagine that this person would dole out millions of dollars in hush money to women. It would basically act like a... Uh, like a fucking child. Uh, Shin Superkick Akuma, the Sala Monster, for over 15 years. The revolutionary force in podcast entertainment. That's right. Going on 16. Maybe 16 years in November. Uh, oh, Harold, Seth Rollins' song is getting annoying. Yes, it is. Money Benny, besides the what chance, what other chance annoy you? You deserve it. You deserve it. Um, fight forever is kind of annoying. I get annoyed very easily. People, people in general annoy me. I notice that as I get older, I just get crankier and just people just tend to uh, get on my nerves more easily. I don't know if I'm alone in feeling that. Visa. Visa Sock. Is, uh, looking good today. Zoe Stark, however. Well, on the mic. Yeah. I think a yikes would be a good word for it. And uh, Booba. Natty isn't Natty. <laughs> Sal O the Monster Rocks. Yeah, Natty isn't Natty. Who is she? If she's not Natty, then who is she? I've been I've been fooled this entire time. Is that it? Man, I could tell. I could tell there was a basketball game tonight. <laughs> That's it. That's all the Super Chats. There ain't nothing else. There ain't nothing else. Everybody, we got, we got 400 votes in the poll. We have like, like five Super Chats. I could tell there was a basketball game tonight. But we just breached the goal for Be the Booker. So we did do that. So thank you for the 400 likes. Uh, keep hitting that like button. And uh, let's get into it. Let's not waste any time. It's time to be the booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to be the booker. And that, that makes it look like I was a member of the Judgment Day there, that super chat. It is time to be the booker. Yeah, I blame Stan Kroenke. You know what? Stan Kroenke, he fucked over all my, uh, my fucking stream tonight. I may cut a promo on him next week. I may pull a Vince McMahon and uh, I'll, I'll do a shoot promo on Stan Kroenke for fucking me over. Well, anyway. At least we get to be the booker. Kick things off here with the men's portion of the show. And we begin with who that? I don't know who that is. I have forgotten who this person is. Oh, it's Bray Wyatt. That's who it is. Bray Wyatt. I had completely forgotten about him. Let's see, uh, Bliss fan will be very happy that Bray Wyatt, he returned to be the booker before he returned to WWE. It'll be Bray Wyatt going one-on-one -on -one with Dude Love. Dude Love and Bray Wyatt. Ah, something about that match, I, I kind of like it. So I'm going to give it the bell. By the way, that woman that you see there on the left in the leopard outfit, I'm almost positive that that is Mix White. Just facially, she looks she looks like uh, she looks like Mix White. I'm pretty sure that's her. So Bray Wyatt and Dude Love is how we kick things off. Yeah, I did that for you, Bliss fan. The promos would be interesting. I would say the promos would be interesting there. All right, let's go to the ladies. And we begin with 
the AEW Women's World Champion, Tony Storm. All right, getting things started on the right foot here. Tony Storm, I like Tony Storm. Yeah, Tony Storm one on one with Mia Yim. All right, I can I can live with that. I'll book that on my show. Tony Storm and Mia Yim, Mi Chin. Not bad, not bad so far. All right, two for two. We're doing good here. Let's keep the train going. We got the tag team portion of the show. Recently updated the tag team portion of the show. A retro KOH just gifted five. Count them five channel memberships. A retro thank you. That's after the 10 that he gifted before. That is a total of 15. Brand spanking new members, thanks to Retro KOH. All right, here we go. It is Seamus and Drew McIntyre. Seamus and Drew McIntyre as a tag team here and Be the Booker. They were doing quite a few tag team matches before Drew went away and took his little sabbatical. Two former world champions in McIntyre and Seamus, even though they don't have a, a proper tag team name. McIntyre and Sheamus going to take on Randy <laughs> Randy Orton and Matt Riddle, RK Bro. What the fuck is Riddle wearing in that image? <laughs> oh, I think, okay, he's trying to be Randy Orton. That's what it is. Oh, the Banger Bros. That's right. That name didn't last very long. They were the Banger Bros. That's right. So it was the Banger Bros against RK Bro. What is that, Vince Russo going to be the referee here? That's a lot of bro. Look at this. He's trying to be, he's dressed up as Randy Orton in this image. He looks ridiculous. He looks like, he looks like a, a Frenchman. All right, well, we got the bangers and the bros. There you go. Three for three and be the booker. I love it. Always good to have a perfect night and be the booker. Uh, we do have a few more Super Chats, thank God. Uh, we got John Quinn. John, thank you for the 1999. Says, appreciate all that you do. We'll be at Hog this Friday because I'm in NYC visiting. Excited for an awesome show. Well, you're going to get one. Got some good shit planned. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, Alberto Ortiz. Thank you very much. For the super chat as well. A hey, uh, Tarkum, Tarkum K Rest is a uh, channel member, and Daddy Ball, actually uh, just renewed for another month here on the channel. Very cool. Actually, let me. Uh, I'll mention it now. I was going to mention it after, but I may as well mention it now. Uh, we have the uh, House of Glory show. Plata Oplomo. Is coming up on Friday. That's this Friday, 8 p.m. For the first time, streaming live on Premier Streaming Network, not on Fight. This is our brand new partner. You can go to watchonpremiere.com. You sign up, uh, and you can order the show individually, or you can, you know, subscribe to Premier Plus. They have a bunch of other things on there. But uh, that is this Friday, June 16th. Vikingo making his House of Glory debut. Carlito making his House of Glory debut, challenging Matt Cardona for the World Championship. Speedball Mike Bailey is on the show making his debut and just announced appearing for the first time since winning the Impact World Championship. Alex Shelley is going to be on the show. We have him back. He was actually, we had the Motor City Machine Guns a couple months ago. And, uh, but now Alex Shelley is actually the Impact World Champion. So congrats to him. He is going to be... On the show on Friday, it's going to be a very stacked card. So that will be uh, Friday night. So there will be no SmackDown stream this week. Uh, Dr. Scorpio, I will be counting on you and others for the collision reviews. The fact that they decide to air it on the TSN streaming service instead of on one of the five regional TSN channels we have is hilarious. Oh, well, their loss. Drew, I love you too, brother. Yeah, I, I just just talking about this on the podcast yesterday. 
five TSN stations, TSN 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now, I had somebody who lives up, up north tell me that it has to do with, I guess, the different time zones, and I wasn't sure if that was the sole reason or not. It's still ridiculous that you have five channels and they couldn't get the show on one of them. It's, it's still ridiculous. So I know there's a lot of people, and I don't, I don't have TSN+. Plus. I am not a Canuck, so I've never used the app. I don't know how shitty it is or it isn't. But I saw a lot of complaints about TSN+. Plus. So apparently there's quite a few people who do not like the service, and uh, they may well not be watching Collision. So I will be here on Saturday for the first Collision when it's over. We'll talk about the return of CM Punk. Very, very curious how the crowd react. I mean, I expect a positive reaction in Chicago. Uh, but you never know. You never know. We'll be uh, covering that live on Saturday night here on the channel. And uh, Domingo Coronado, thank you for the four ninety nine. Best match to show a new fan. I choose Michaels against Benjamin from Raw. Great action, nothing over the top, and an awesome finish. I will give you one right now, and it's actually one that we're going to be watching tomorrow on the watch along. It is Bret Hart and Mr. Perfect from the King of the Ring in nineteen ninety three. There was a match that I had to show to a new fan who wanted to see what professional wrestling is all about. That is a match I would show. Groovy Goose is very excited for the stream tomorrow. One o'clock Eastern, we'll be here. And uh, I got the timestamps from Peacock and everything, and <laughs> the stream may be longer than I intended for it to be. So uh, it could be, you know, it could, it could be a ninety-minute stream or or longer. But we're gonna have some fun. We'll watch some a uh, little bit of the King of the Ring in '93 tomorrow. I got a lot of a lot of notes. I got a lot of insight into the show. Things you may or may not know. So we'll have fun tomorrow afternoon. Uh, Arabian Night. How do you feel about Becky's promo skills? They are mid. Uh, tonight, tonight they were. Tonight they were terrible. I actually, I feel like her her promos have definitely. Uh, fallen off from what they used to be. And I think it, it could just be that the character, when she was doing it at the time, it caught fire, it was fresh. It was a different attitude for her. It was a total attitude adjustment for her character at the end of uh, 2018 when she started doing The Man and everything. And now it's almost like she's doing a parody of it. I don't know, it's weird. It's, it's very weird. But tonight, her, her and Zoe, that whole thing was just a, a fucking fail. That whole thing was... That whole thing was just awful. Just terrible. Uh, Dr. Scorpio, yes, from what I hear, the app sucks. Yeah, that's what I am getting. That's what I am getting from all of you. Is that uh, TSM Plus is not very good. Uh, will there be a Be the Booker tomorrow? We'll see. Possibly. Possibly. HBK C83. Uh, what is the best TNA match that you have ever seen? Hmm. Best TNA match that I've ever seen. Probably Kurt Angle and Samoa Joe. Um, they had that cage match that they had. Angle and Joe in a cage, if it's not the best, it's definitely up there. Uh, oh, well, you know what? I, I think I pretty much would concur with what a lot of other people would say the triple threat from Unbreakable in 2005. Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, Christopher Daniels, that's that's on the list for sure. That one that one is definitely on the list. Yeah, it might it might be one of those two. Uh Juan Ocampo to watch solo or Pat McAfee show. Decisions, decisions. Oh, McAfee show was on in the morning at like 10 a.m. or something. Is it on at 1 o'clock in the afternoon? Well, it shouldn't be a very difficult decision. Pat McAfee is on every single day. How many times do you get me at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday? Come hang out with me. We'll have fun. We'll have a, good, we'll have a grand old time. So, again, that is uh, going to be coming up tomorrow. There it is right there, 30th anniversary, King of the Ring, 1993. Watch along. 
Bret Hart and Razor Ramon. Bret Hart and Mr. Perfect. Bret Hart and that man. Bam Bam Bigelow. And uh, we'll talk about all the stuff in between. I, I, I'm i very uh, excited to get to retell the story of the confrontation between Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan that took place in the back right before Bret went out for that match with Bam Bam. And what Bret said to Hogan in the back that night. I always love telling that story. So we'll, we'll, we'll share some tales on the stream tomorrow. So just to bring you up to speed on what the schedule is, tomorrow, 1 o'clock, watch along. Wednesday night, Dynamite. Thursday, quiet. Friday, no SmackDown review. Saturday night, though, there will be a collision review, the very first AEW collision episode airing on TNT. And, of course, on Sunday, that is Father's Day, episode 813 of the Solomonster Sounds Off. So pretty busy week. Even without the Friday stream, it's going to be a busy week. Uh, Thunder Force with the six bucks says, I hate the you still got it, Chow. Oh, there you go. That's another one. Yeah. You still got it, Chan, especially when it's directed at someone who doesn't, who doesn't like Ric Flair. Did they chant that at Flair? I don't remember. Did they chant you still got it at Flair on that Flair's last match pay-per-view? Maybe they were talking about his heart problems. They were saying, you still got it. Like, you still have your, your heart issues. You should get out of the ring. Maybe that's what they meant. Uh, Arabian Night, Cody and Drew both left WWE and came back a few years later a bigger star. Who do you wish followed the same path as them? I always felt Dolph should have left in 2016. I did feel that way about Dolph many years ago. I don't anymore. I mean, Dolph. Dolph is happy where he is. You know, he's happy making money and putting other people over. And, and hey, that's cool. You know, he makes, I'm sure he makes a very good living for himself. But if Dolph really wanted to leave and try to come back a bigger star, he would have. He had the chance to. He didn't do it. He made his choice. It just wasn't something that he wanted to do. If it's something that he really wanted to do, he would have left. So, yeah, I respect his decision, but... I definitely think there was a period of time where he could have left and he could have had that second chance run that someone like Drew ended up having. Um, but, you know, look, we all make our choices and as long as he's happy and making a good living for himself, then uh, that's all that matters. All right, so uh, I'm going to get out of here. Thank you for the uh, love. Kind of a quiet night, but we... Uh, we were up against some competition tonight. Wrestling was up against some competition tonight. We'll see what those uh, basketball numbers look like tomorrow. I'll see you guys in uh, how many hours is it? Uh, 13? About 13? No, actually, it's about 12. About 12 hours from now. I'm going to be live with you again. Be well. Stay safe. And uh, I will see you back here for more Sound Off on YouTube on Tuesday. I wonder if that little man is still struggling to fall into the hole. Poor guy. You know what? I think he is. Let's go back to the little man and we'll see how he's doing. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care. Hey, Christopher, I almost forgot Christopher. Christopher Perez had a super chat as well that I almost missed, but I just spotted it. So I want to make sure I get to Christopher here. Christopher wants to know, how about Johnny Gargano answering Rollins' open challenge in Cleveland next week? And that is that is an interesting point. They are in Cleveland next week. Johnny Gargano has been off television, although they did run a video package for him. I think it was last week or the week before. Um, could very well be Johnny Gargano. Could very well be Johnny Gargano. 
if, if Braun Breaker is going to be a separate thing and it's not going to be Logan Paul, let's say, he's going to be doing something else, um, Cleveland would be a hell of a place. Cleveland would be a place. Hey, Tommaso Champ is on his way back soon, too. But Cleveland is Johnny Gargano's town, so I, I think Christopher's on to something here. I think, Christopher, you may be right. So, Thank you, brother. Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. I'll see you guys tomorrow.